Good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Oh, perfect. My name is Donovan Brown, and I am a senior DevOps program manager for Microsoft. I've been slinging code for about 20 years, and I just geek out over process. So they brought me to Microsoft so that I could help shape the DevOps vision on Team Foundation Server and on Visual Studio Team Services. As you can see by the slide, I'm very, very competitive, right? The 11th best air hockey player in the world. I bring that competitive nature with me to work every day to ensure that Microsoft has the best DevOps offering in the world. I am really glad to be here today because I have a friend and a colleague of mine, Jeremy, with me, who is going to help us take a lap around Visual Studio Team Services and show you all the greatness that we have. Hey, everyone. I'm Jeremy Epling. I am also on the Team Services and Team Foundation Server Team as a Principal Program Manager. And I focus on Git and version control. And I have an awesome new announcement that you can see right here. My son actually took his first steps yesterday. Woo! I thank all of you for that. He was so excited for build, he just wanted to walk all the way here, but <laughs> he couldn't quite make it all the way from North Carolina. Awesome, um, awesome. And yeah, like Donovan, been writing code for a long time. I remember going to the Walden bookstore and actually picking up my <laughs> How to Write Code in C++ in 30 Days book when wow. I was in high school. <laughs> I did C in 21 Days. That was my first book, so <laughs> nice. yeah, awesome. Uh, so like we said, we both work on a team that works with Team Foundation Server and Visual Studio Team Services. They're like two sides to the same coin. One of them you get to install yourself, the other one we host for you. But what they are are collaboration hubs. They are everything that you need to turn an idea into a working piece of software. It does not matter what language you program in, it does not matter what platform you target, mobile or otherwise, we have everything that you need. Microsoft is the only vendor on the planet that can say what I'm saying right now. We have everything, including the cloud for you to host it in. You want to go ahead and do repositories? How many of you guys love Git? You're all younger than 40. Everyone else raise your hands who hate Git. <laughs> right? That's me. <laughs> cool thing is, is that if you love Git or hate Git, we have Git for you, including TFVC for those guys who still like centralized version control. You got to build it. We can build it anywhere. Let me give you a little, when I say anywhere, I mean anywhere. The first time that I installed Linux was after I joined Microsoft. Let that sink in for a second. After I joined Microsoft is when I had to learn Linux. Why? Because our build system works happily on Linux, it works on Mac, and it works on Windows. You want to do Java, Node.js, JavaScript, whatever you want to do, we actually can build it for you and deploy it to any platform. You got to test it. Right? Our customers are demanding quality, and we can run every unit testing framework imaginable. You want to run Mocha, you want to run Jasmine, you want to run JUnit, NUnit, MBUnit, you want to use fakes, whatever you want to do, we can run those tests for you and even give you code coverage. And I'll show you some of that later. After that, we have to get feedback, right? Our users are now using our application, and we want to be able to get that feedback from them. Are you enjoying that new feature? Did it work the way that it was supposed to work? Can we do something better? And we have a way for you to get that feedback back inside of your team. And then finally, monitoring and improving, or monitoring and learning. The best way to determine if your, your users are happy is to monitor what they do with your application. We just added a new feature. Are they finding it? Are they able to get there? Are we losing them in that wizard? Are they completing it or not? We can actually give you that information so that it drives back into your product backlog to make sure you're delivering value to your end users. Another part of having an end-to-end -end offering is making sure it scales up even to the largest companies that are out there. And Team Services is completely enterprise ready. A lot of companies have been using our on-prem solution for 10 years, and now we've brought all of that know-how to the cloud, and it's been up and running for three years already. And we continue just to innovate in this space. One of the top things customers ask around is compliance. So I'm happy to announce today, in addition to our already having ISO compliance, in EU model clause compliance, we also have SOC level one and SOC level two. So these are world-class security standards verified by <laughs> independent auditors. Yeah, feel free to clap for that. We are trying to get rid of every excuse you've tried to make to not go to the cloud. That's <laughs> exactly. basically the, the subtitle there. Data sovereignty, so we have local data centers all throughout the world. And by the second half of 2016, we're actually going to be bringing on online two more, one in Brazil and another in India. 
data import. This is something I'm very excited about. So you're going to hear a little bit more about this tomorrow. I don't want to steal Scott's thunder at the demo, but we have a major customer that has migrated everything from TFS onto the cloud, and it's going great. Lots of code, lots of developers, lots of work items. If you're interested to get into this program, you can come up and talk to me or Ed or Donovan afterward, and then we're going to have it generally available soon. Active Directory. The last thing you want is for your, your, your developers and your organization to have to deal with multiple passwords and sign-in and all the security issues that go with that. We have single sign-on, and we have multi-factor auth support. Process customization. So in your agile processes, you want to be able to customize that work item form to meet your team's needs, and we make that possible. Code search. This is really great for creating that internal open source uh, code sharing uh, community within your company. So if I'm searching for something, we can search across all the repos, all the team projects. I can quickly see if someone else has already written something that I want to go do. And then finally, reporting, having great charts so I get that at a glance view of what's going on. Absolutely. Having a little clicker issue. There yeah. we go. There we go. All right, so next up, the marketplace. So we actually launched the marketplace just in November, and we've seen thousands of extensions already come on board. There's extensions for VS Code, for Visual Studio, and for Team Services. And these are really well-known extensions that you've heard of before. We have integration with Slack, with GitHub. As Donovan mentioned, we have a great end-to-end -end product where you can really do the entire end-to-end -end DevOps lifecycle just with Team Services. But we know you have other tools that you love, or maybe you're working on migrating more to team services, and we make that all possible with these extensions. And then I'm also happy to announce these are now available with Update 2 on Team Foundation Service. So take all the extensions you love and bring them to your on-prem product. Now I'm excited to bring up Edith from LaunchDarkly. This is an extension that I truly love. It's all about feature flags. So as a product manager, this is really important to me. I want to be able to light up features one by one for maybe a small set of customers and slowly ramp them out. Maybe I have a really big feature that we're rolling out, a massive architectural change, and then I want to make sure that that goes smoothly. And feature flags really make that possible. Thanks. So here's Edith. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so I remember learning to code in BASIC and what a revelization uh, Visual Basic was when it came out, because I was like, wow, life just got a lot easier. I don't have to jump lines anymore. Um, I think the trend that's happened in DevOps is the same, that life is getting a lot easier. Um, so I'm pleased to announce our uh, Visual Team Studios integration today. It's live in the marketplace. You can go and get it. And what it does is make your life easier. Uh, the old way of doing releases was to do a big monolithic release, push it out to everybody all at once, and if something went wrong, it was really bad. Like, it was really bad depending on what went bad, because if you had a bug out there, if you had an issue, everybody saw it all at once. What feature flagging is is the ability to selectively push out features to who you want, when you want. It's a tool that companies like Microsoft, Microsoft have been doing for years with Canary releases, and now we're enabling everybody else to do it, too. So our extension allows you to associate a feature flag with a work item here. And then when you're running your release, you can select what percentage of users get this new feature. Well, what if I want to target some specific users instead of just 10%? That, that's a great example. So um, even this morning, a, a LaunchDarkly customer wrote us, and they were really excited about something that we're building right now. And you always have a mix of customers of people who are really excited about your new features and are eager to take a beta version, and then people on the other side who say, do not give me anything until it's absolutely final. Like, I don't, I don't want to see a risk. So what, with, with LaunchDarkly, we give you an easy dashboard where you can pick who you want to see a feature. You could give early features to the users you want, and you can exclude the users that you don't want. So the, the final part of our extension is then when you run the release, uh, right within Visual Team Studios, Visual, you can see the feature flags that are rolled out. Uh, so overall, we're super excited about this extension. We think it gives a lot of flexibility to developers to move a little bit faster, because you can give features early to who you want and reduce risk, because it's easy to then roll them back to, to people if they're not working out well. Great. Thanks, Edith. Let's give her a round of applause. That's exciting. Feature flags are really at the heart of this DevOps lifecycle, where you can control your release out and get feedback from customers. 
So let's talk a little bit about the DevOps lifecycle. I get a lot of questions on what does this actually mean? There's the on-the-nose definition of developers and operations working together. But I think it's a little bit more than that. So you can start up in the top left. There's around planning and tracking. So this is where you've come up with your great idea, and you need to turn it into reality. So we go from there, getting it on your board, monitoring progress. Go down number two to develop and test. So this is where you start writing code, working on unit tests, get everything building, really make that idea come to life. Three, you start to release it out to customers, and maybe you're flighting that out to a small set of customers. And then finally, monitor and learn. So this is where you get all the feedback. As a product manager, this is where I really geek out every single day. I'm every day pulling out my dashboard, and I'm looking to see what's going on with the different users. We roll something out. Is it working? Is it not working? How can we change it? How do we want to modify the design? And then the whole loop starts all over again. So now I'm going to dig in and walk you through a little bit of what this experience is for the plan and track side inside Team Services. So we have an agile product that hopefully many of you are familiar with. And there's a couple different things I'm going to show in the demo. One of them is the at-a-glance view of dashboards and charts. We're going to dig into backlogs, specifically Kanban boards, and see how you can really customize that to get a deeper view and visualize the flow of your work as it moves across your DevOps lifecycle. Check out an amazing new work item form. Look at some of the social experiences that really promote communication around a specific artifact so it doesn't get lost in email or Slack or somewhere else. Customizable agile processes for large companies that really need to be able to do something specific. And finally, integrating with that next phase of the DevOps lifecycle, which is dev and test. So let's jump over and look at some demos. So as you can see right here, I've got a dashboard that I've configured for my team. Imagine we're building a health clinic app. So I have a set of widgets. These are all out-of-the-box widgets, out widgets that we provide. So there's a markdown one. And I've listed, like, what's my team's vision? What's our mission? I've hooked one up here to see what our progress is on the sprint, so I can quickly visualize that. I can see the balance between bugs and stories, number of work item days remaining, see all the beautiful faces of the people on our team. I can check out burn down, and you can see I have an interactive graph right here, so I can see the status and how it was on specific days. We use Hockey App in this mobile app, so I can quickly jump over to Hockey App. I can see my crash reports, downloads. Case studies, you can go down here. I can see pull requests that are open on the team. I can see the tasks divided by people. And I've actually created this uh, bug report right here where this actually changes depending on the bug number. So if you have over 35 bugs, it turns red, so it really pops. So the second you go to the dashboard, you can know if something's wrong. The great thing about these dashboards, as I said, is that they're fully customizable. So I can go here and edit my dashboard. You can go ahead and rearrange it however you want and you can add extensions. And all of these widgets have out-of-the-box support. So all the graphs that you're seeing for builds, you can hook it up to any query you want to get that customized look and feel for your team. And you can build as many dashboards as you want. So in this case, I'll also build a My Dashboard. The great thing about this one is, because it's all hooked up to My Queries, whoever comes to this actually sees a personalized view of this dashboard. So right now, I'm seeing that I have two bugs. But if Donovan was on here, he'd probably see a little bit more. I can check out the pull request, my chart, and you can imagine building dashboards for anything, a quality dashboard or something else. So now let's actually jump into the backlog. So every backlog has an ordered list of items, as you know, but I'm actually going to jump over to the board because I want to visualize this data. So I can click over here with a great new keyboard shortcut to add. I just click Z, and I'm in full screen. So what you can see is I've added some custom columns across the top to reflect my team's DevOps lifecycle. So right here, you can see I have a plan column for things that we're planning. When they move in development test, I move them here. And I actually have a split column so I can see when things are doing versus when they're done. And if anyone's confused about what that means, you can click right here and actually wrote that definition in Markdown right here. And it just appears right inside the dashboard, or right inside the board. And then I can move over to release a monitor. Maybe we've got a couple features. We're seeing what's going on with them, making sure we're achieving the goal that we had. And then I can move them over to done when I'm finished. I also have two swim lanes. So up here is an expedite swim lane. So this is where if I have a really hot critical issue that's coming in, I can immediately pull it to the top. Everybody can see it. So when we're discussing in the stand up, everybody knows what's going on. So let's look at one of these cards right down here. So I've got this one assigned to me right here to implement a bar chart. One of the things you'll notice is some color coded tags that I've placed on here. So I quickly know that it's blocked. I know it's about the patient area that we're working on. Maybe we're in a stand-up right now, and I just want to mark off what's going on. So I can click right here, 
and I can see the associated tasks right with that user story. I don't have to open it up, go to a links tab, copy and paste things back and forth. It's all right there, right at my fingertips. And I just click. Now these are marked done. If I wanted to create a new one, I can click on Add Task and just type right into the box, and that association's right there. So it's all about making these tasks that were somewhat complex to sort of pull together that DevOps lifecycle, make them seamless so they're just right there, right at your fingertips. Then I'm going to go through, and I've got a couple of tests. Well, this one worked, so I can mark this passing, and this one failed. Now let's jump in and see a little bit more for if I need that next level of depth. So we have a new work item form that's much more readable, and it is set up for some great process customization. So you can see over here I have a description. I have posted it in a picture, so it's really easy for me to see what needs to be done. And I'm actually having a discussion right here with Aaron about what's going on. So he at mentioned to me right here, Jeremy, and he also did a hashtag mention of this work item. So that automatically set up the links as soon as he did that. And the great thing about at mentions are, I get an email notification the second that happens. So I know the comment that he made, and I also have a link back to the work item with a snippet of what that work item is about. And I'll show you how easy it is. If I just want to go and respond back to Aaron, click right here. I can auto-complete right on Aaron. I do a hashtag. And these are actually the bugs that I've touched most recently. So we're just trying to pull that all the way up to the top, reduce all that hunting and pecking and finding, remembering a bug number, what was the title, I don't know. If you've touched it recently, it's right on this list. And when we've looked at our telemetry, people pretty much always click the top one, and after the top three, it really drops off. So we really feel like we're hitting this. Another thing that you'll notice is process customization. So our My Health Clinic app, I've actually added three custom fields right here, and I've chose to put them in the status column. So you can see this one's actually a pick list, and this is going to be a feature that's coming out soon. Support for pick lists on here. So I have an integer one, uh, so I have a string pick list, and then I just have a free form integer field here. But in the past with, uh, with TFS, one of the things you've had to deal with is an XML file, and then you have to also deal with, okay, if I'm going to customize the process on this team project, it's separate than that one, it's separate than that one, I have to copy it. It's just a huge pain. Well, we've simplified that all online on the hosted service. So now I can come in, and I can look at all of my different work item types down the left-hand side. And you can see I have this WYSIWYG environment right here, where I've gone ahead and customized the one we were just looking at, the product backlog item. I've said acceptance criteria. I don't need that one. But what I actually need is to know my score, my page, the priority. And I've added these right here. So you get an idea right there on the form of what it's going to look like when you're customizing it. You can create new groups. You can create new fields of many different types. And we're continuing to add more flexibility to this. One of the sections that I personally worked on and love a ton is actually the development section over here on the left. So this really helps attach your code to your work items. So what I can do, and I'll show you in a second, the second I associate a branch with a work item, we remember that association. And we keep that going forward for every artifact that gets uh, created from that branch. So you create a pull request, it's automatically associated here. No going back and forth, copy and pasting things that you know no one on your team's actually going to go do. And then once the code gets into master, you then have all the commits listed right there. So it's really easy for a product manager to see what's going on or a manager on the team to quickly get that at a glance view. Two other features I've been waiting on for a while and I'm really excited about is delete work item. Come on. That one just rolled out recently. And this one, as I'm sure another crowd pleaser, move work item. So you can finally move work items across team projects. So now let's see how easy this is to go across. I'm going to close this. Now let's say there's a bug assigned to me right here. If I just want to move it over, it's actually, let's jump over and do a little customization on this board. So I've actually created a couple styles. Let's say that the colorized tags weren't enough to really make things pop for you. So I'm going to enable these conditional formatting styles that I have right here. Now it's really clear what's going on. I can see this bug right here is blocked, and I can see that these are high priority. So I'm going to drag this bug right over here. We're going to skip the plan column because it's a high priority issue. Right from here, I can go ahead and add tests or tasks like we talked about before, but I can also create a new branch right from here. So right in your sprint meeting, you can go through and create the branch. I'm going to call this fix bug. I can choose from any of the repos that I have if I have multiple Git repos. 
I can go ahead and pick the branch it's based off of, the work item's already associated, and if I wanted to add another work item, I could just do it right there. So again, what you can see is this end-to-end -end flow. You can get an at-a-glance with dashboards. You can customize your processes. You can get that deep view of what's going on with your team and visualize that flow with the board, and then link all of that to the code that you're actually writing. Now let's jump back and look at the next phase of DevOps. So the next thing is develop and test. So this is where the real work starts to happen. You start to write code, get your unit tests, make some commits, push those up to your server, and start to build. So there's a couple things we've been doing, and a lot of our focus has been bringing Git up to the same level of quality that we have with TFBC. I shouldn't say quality, really the same level of functionality. We have a lot of great features in TFBC because we've been investing in it for so long, and we're trying to bring Git right up there with it. And I think we're getting really close. So end-to-end -end DevOps traceability, just like I showed you with Agile, you're gonna see that same connectivity within all of the different artifacts that you create, whether it be a pull request or connected to a build, it be connected to a, um, a commit, all of that's there and those are all linked back to the work item. We've been doing a major push in cross-platform. We actually now have plugins for all the major um, JetBrains IDEs, as well as Eclipse, so Android Studio, IntelliJ, I'll show you some of those. Social code reviews, that same experience that you love in work items will be brought here. Semantic code search, and then some amazing new features in Visual Studio. So let's jump into a demo. So I'm starting off right here looking at my repo on the web. Now let's say maybe I haven't done any work in this repo, so I wanna go get started with my clone button. This is where you can see some of that integration I talked about. As you would expect, yeah, I can click a, bu a button right here and clone inside Visual Studio. We've got a protocol handler all set up, but we've expanded that now to all the IntelliJ IDEs as well. So if you're working on a Java app, if you're working on a Python app, your Android app, we really wanna be the best set of tools independent of where you wanna write your code, what language you wanna write it in, what platform you wanna target, we are there to provide that best system for you. And then in addition, something that's been highly requested on our user voice site, like a lot of these features, is SSH support. Oh, come on, give me something for that. This one has been great. So if you work on Mac or Linux, you know how easy it is to have that single sign-on experience with SSH, especially with a lot of your CI tools, it just makes your life so much easier. So we're actually rolling that out right now, and by the end of April, it should be available to all of our customers. Another thing that you'll see is the links to the plugins I talked about. One of the great things, I don't know if some people saw this, GitHub had a blog post yesterday talking about the new version of Git, Git uh, 2.8, the client that's out available for everyone. One of the things that they mentioned was that, hey, it's got, Git has gotten a lot better on Windows. Well, you're wondering how that happened? It was actually our team doing that. We are now contributing to core Git and to Git for Windows, and we're working to unify Git for Windows and core Git. Um, Johannes, an amazing developer on our team who's been the maintainer for Git for Windows for years, has actually been doing even more work there. And we wanna provide that same seamless single sign-on experience that you have with AAD on the web and that you have with MSA. We've brought that to the command line as well. So with all these plugins, you get easy seamless sign-on, but now in the command line, you type in there, if we need to authenticate, we'll pop up a little web browser. You can do that, you can do multi-factor auth and then go back to your command line. We create a personal access token on the back end to make it really easy for you to manage that lifetime and security. So again, a seamless experience, doesn't matter which platform you're on, if you're on Mac or Linux. And this isn't showing Mac and Linux only because I'm not on Mac and Linux right now. Um, so now let's jump in and do a quick search. So let's say I'm fixing a bug. And I remember there was some exception. It had something with username in it. You can see there's some awesome advanced syntax I can use, but maybe I can't remember exactly what it is. So I'm just going to search username. And I'm going to go through, and it's going to search all of the repos across all of the team projects in my account. I can go down through here and I can go ahead and see some different repos here. So I'm gonna be like, okay, I think this was in the My Health Clinic repo. So I'm gonna click on that one. And now that I've scoped that down, it allows me to further scope. So if I knew which path it was in, I could go ahead and narrow down my search that way. But in this case, I actually know it's a definition. So I'm just gonna click on there. So this is really interesting. We semantically understand what is going on with your code. So we can target those searches down to just a definition, just a reference, a property, just to help you to find what you're looking for even faster. So I'm gonna click definition, and I'm right here. This is exactly what I was looking for. So now, let's say I'm gonna go fix this bug. I wanna go over to the history. Let's go look at the commit that put this in there. 
So again, like I talked about with linkability, here was an easy harmless fix that I did. We all know what those are like. And so what you'll notice is, since this commit has made it into my default branch, which is master, it now tells me right there. This is a question I have to ask all the time, especially if someone checks in some code and there's an issue, I'm wondering, okay, is this thing in master? Is it not there? Is it in my default branch? Which branch is it in? So we go ahead and pull that up and answer the question right there. And in addition, a lot of times when I'm looking at a diff, I made, it tells me what the change was, but it doesn't tell me why the change was made. And that's pretty important, so debugging an issue and understanding what's going on. So we have a link to the pull request that introduced the change right here. So again, these are just more examples of how we're linking all these different artifacts together to make it really easy for you to have that end-to-end -end DevOps experience. Now we're gonna jump over to Visual Studio, and I'm gonna show you a couple things that we've done here. So if you've used update one, one of the things that you'll notice is we actually have a branch switcher down here. So I can see all of my branches, I can create a new one or view history, and I can see my repo. An additional thing that we've done is added two more compartments to the status bar. So I can see all of my unpublished commits. So these are the commits that I've made locally that haven't made it to the server. Basically, if this number gets high, you need to go push your code up to the server because it's just trapped on your machine. So it's just a great reminder to keep that going. I can also click right here and I can see all the files I've changed. So a lot of the time when I'm writing code, I'm in Solution Explorer, I'm doing something else, I don't wanna have to go dig through Team Explorer. These are my quick links just into the places that I need to get to quickly. Another thing that I wanna announce about this project specifically is it supports submodules. Now Visual Studio finally supports cloning down repositories with submodules and checking them out, which was one of our top user voice requests for the last couple months. Now I'm gonna jump in here and look at the changes. So you can see I've linked a work item right in there. So I can click the plus, I can go ahead and type in the work item number and it'll be linked for there, I've already done that. You can see we added staging support as well. So a lot of people that use Git love staging on the command line, now that supports right here. I can stage individual files or I can go through and stage all of my changes. I can choose to commit my staged work right there. Another big part of Git is figuring out what's going on with the history. And to visualize history, you really need the graph. The last thing I wanna do is like pull up git k or deal with like a graph inside my terminal window. It's useful, but it's not a pleasant experience to actually get what I need. So we've gone through and, and we have an amazing graph here that you can go and see. And then we've added some new functionality to that graph as well for common git commands. So I can reset, I can do mixed or hard. If you're familiar with the command line, we're adding more of that command line functionality right into the GUI or I can go ahead and cherry pick a commit. This is really great if maybe something's in master, you actually need to take that bug fix, get it to one of your release branches really quickly, you can just cherry pick that commit right over. And then with uh, Team Explorer, another thing you have is, as you've had for a while, is links to all of your work items and pull requests. And a lot of the same linking functionality, we're actually bringing to all the IntelliJ plugins as well, as well as Eclipse. So you're gonna have access to your pull requests, see what's going on there, all right from those other IDEs as well. So now let's jump back to the web, since we're speaking of pull requests, and look at the new pull request view that we've built. So on our team, we actually have a lot of developers in a single repo. We have a couple hundred that just work in one repo. So you can imagine the number of branches and pull requests that are constantly going on. So what we've done for those large teams, and it's even good for small teams, is create this my pivot. So when I go to mine, I can see just the pull requests. It cuts through the clutter. I can see just what I need. So I can see that I've requested these two pull requests. I can quickly get an idea of the status. I can see the source and target branch. And I can go ahead and see through who's voted on these. So I can see, okay, Donovan is waiting for feedback for me. There's a couple comments. I should probably check that out. I can see Brian Keller went ahead and approved this one. I can also see pull requests that are assigned to me. And then I can also see ones that my team's working on, which is a great way, maybe if you're a senior developer on the team or a manager and you wanna monitor all the other pull requests, or you're just interested in what other people are doing on your team. So I'm gonna jump into this one. And what you'll notice is, again, I have like a default social view, so I get to see the discussion that's happening right here in real time. I can see Donovan left a comment for me right here. I can mark individual comments as active or resolved so I can track how people are doing. I can go through and click reply, and that same functionality we talked about before with the at mentions, it's right here. The exact same experience, and this is one of the benefits of having a single product that really does everything for you for your entire DevOps lifecycle. There's no extra work, it's all just integrated right there, right at your fingertips. And 
let's assume that this pull request was approved and I'm gonna go through here. I can do complete pull request. And we've gone ahead and customized this more. There's definitely philosophies around Git where people conflict. Some people love merge, some people love rebase, some people love to use tags for releases, some people use, love to use branches. What we're trying to do is to be a tool that guides you down uh, a path, but also allow that diversity to really flourish and work. So when I complete a pull request, I can go ahead and edit the title, but we put one in there for you in description. A lot of people use a topic branch workflow, and you can see that's pre-checked right here. So the second that my um, pull request is completed and merged into the, default, or into the default branch, which happens to be master, it's gonna go through and delete my topic branch for me, so I don't even have to worry about that step. And then if I'm someone that likes a clean history, I can go ahead and squash these changes as well. I know this is a religious debate for some people, but some people love to squash all their changes and have that linear history, so we give you the flexibility to do that as well. But sometimes you wanna require a certain code of conduct on your team, and that's where branch policies come in. So we have a lot of policies that will allow you to enforce a certain set of behaviors on your team. So I can go through and say, hey, I want to automatically create a build every single time there's a pull request to have my CI system go. And I want to make sure that it needs to be at least two hours or newer. And you know what? I'm actually going to block pull requests if they don't have a successful build. That seems like a common sense one to me. You can choose to require or block if people aren't associated with work items. I've said that I need a minimum of two reviewers on every change to be signed off. Then I've gone through here and actually customized different source code paths to require certain reviewers. So if you go through and you make a change in myhealthclinic.database, automatically, when you create the pull request, Donovan and the entire Health Clinic DB team will automatically be added to that pull request and get an email so they know that something's going on right there. So this is a great way for you to have that consistent experience, a consistent history in your code, and really tie it all together. So that's it for Git and version control. And I'd like to welcome up Donovan to go talk about testing and the rest of our DevOps lifecycle. That's awesome stuff, man. Thanks, Donovan. Thank you so much, Jeremy. <laughs> you almost made me like Git, almost. <laughs> A lot of cool stuff there. Uh, but no matter what version control that you use, you're gonna have to test the application that you're gonna be uh, giving out to your end users. And what I'm gonna be showing with you today is some of the stuff that we've been doing to actually enhance the way that you do your testing. So my, great, my session would have expired while I was talking to you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh this over here. But we've done a lot with testing. Um, one of the things that we've done is that we've enabled code coverage for Java support. Remember earlier I said any language, any platform? We're taking that really, really seriously. We don't want you to have a subpar experience if you're not using .NET. We want you to have that same great, rich experience that you have, regardless of what language that you're using. And Java is an extremely popular language, and we want to make sure that all those Java developers feel the same love that we give all of our .NET developers as well. And so you're, I'm going to show you some of that code coverage support. Parallel execution. You'd be surprised how few people actually write unit tests. And shame on you, because I know you're in here, right? <laughs> But hopefully you're going to start to write unit tests, and you're going to start to understand the power and the safety that they bring to you. And when you get really good at it, you write a lot of them. And what we're going to do is allow you to actually run those in parallel so that you can actually get that testing done and not it be a, let it be a burden upon your productivity and your acceleration of your de deployment. But what I'm going to show you here today is I'm going to show you some of the exploratory testing features, which I just think are incredible. So we kind of hinted at some of this stuff while we were in, uh, at Connect, but I wanted to give it to you one more time because we've actually added a lot of cool stuff. What you're seeing on the screen right now is a partnership that we have with Perfecto Mobile, which is a great partner of ours that helps us do a lot of mobile testing. And what we've done is we've partnered with them so that I can do things like mobile testing with our exploratory testing directly on a physical device. So what I've done is I've uploaded my application to Perfecto Mobile, and they've installed it on a Windows phone for me that allows me to go back in and test my application. Directly from their web browser, I'm able to do things like take screenshots of what's going on. If I am not happy with just screenshots and I need a little bit more power, we just added the ability for you to do video recordings, actual recording of the video so that you can see what I was doing and not just get the end result. Because we've all gotten that screenshot that is the blue screen of death, but we have no idea how they got there, right? And they swear up and down they did everything right and somehow I ended up here and it broke. But if I could see what you did, if I could see the buttons that you clicked, then all of a sudden I could get the whole picture and have a, have a chance of going back and fixing that. So we added that as well. We've always had the ability for you to add 
create bugs and create test cases from the actions that you take, but we also added the ability for you to create tasks. Because as I'm in there testing it, I might think of something that I need to go back later and go ahead and complete. But I, it's not a bug, it's not a test case, it's just things I need to go back in and finish. And now we allow you to add those tasks for you as well. In addition to that, we have a timeline that allows you to see everything that I do on this particular screen. And it was funny because I was having trouble logging into this earlier, and I used our, our exploratory testing to send a bug to the guy saying, guys, I'm having trouble logging in, let me show you what I'm doing. And I used our own exploratory testing to go back and tell the Perfecto guys, I need a little help because my password may be expired or something. It was really neat to be able to use the tools to show them exactly how we were uh, actually gonna go back and fix that. In addition to this, we can automate this stuff, and we're gonna be able to do this during our DevOps pipeline. And that's not just unit testing, not just UI testing, we're talking about cloud-based load testing. Any testing framework you use today, chances are we already know how to do it. The reason why is because anything that I can do from a command line, I can do from our build system. Anything. So before you raise your hand afterward and say, Donovan, can you help me run X? I'm gonna ask you, can I do X from a command line? If the answer is yes, then the answer is yes. That goes for anything, not just test. If there's pin tests you wanna do, load tests you wanna do, if there's some type of validation that you wanna do that I have never heard of before, if you can show me a command line, I will show you how to do it in our build system and our release system. If you don't have a command line but you have a REST API, guess what? I can get there too because I have Node.js and I have PowerShell at my disposal, which means I can do it on a Mac, I can do it on Linux, or I can do it on Windows. Anything is possible. Literally, the sky is the limit. I have yet to meet a task that I have not been able to achieve with our build and our CI system, which I'll show you here in a second. So what I wanted to do is basically give you another lap around our, our exploratory testing. We're very excited about it. It's a plugin inside of Chrome that it basically gives you exploratory testing everywhere that you need it. Okay, so let me jump back over to our slides here real quick. In addition to making improvements over testing, the other thing that we've been working on here is our continuous integration. I'm a huge fan of our continuous integration system. Uh, being on the product group, I talk to customers all the time. I have to go in and I have to compete a lot against our competitors. And this is the first time that I really feel that I can go into those customers knowing that I can win every client that I go and talk to. Any of you guys ever used our XAML-based build system? How many of you were brave enough to try to customize it? I am sorry to all of you with your hands up right now. You know how hard that was, right? I was a consultant. I loved it because I knew how hard it was, and you had to hire me to go fix it for you, right? But now I work for Microsoft, and that's not good anymore, right? We need it to be easy, easy, easy for you to use. We have to go back and compete with a lot of people who have made it just stupid easy, and I think we've finally gotten that right. In addition to continuous integration, though, we've also done package management. How many of you guys need to take your NuGet packages that you create and store them in a way that you can then share it with your organization, yet not put them public? Right? You don't want them exactly, all of us. We're all writing these packages, these small, reusable pieces of code, but it's really difficult for us to distribute them to the other teams that need them. We now have this baked inside of Visual Studio Team Services, no longer having to worry about making it public and allowing you to easily search for it, find it, and use it in your DevOps pipeline. I'm gonna do something a little different for this particular demo. I'm not gonna show you demoware. I use all of this stuff. So every time you get me on stage and I'm all passionate and excited and you wonder why, it's because I use all this stuff. So I'm gonna actually show you two of my actual DevOps pipelines that I use these features in so you can see how I've used them in a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So this is actually real code that you're gonna see here. This is not me um, creating a demo. I'm not too shabby at creating demos, but I thought it'd be cooler for you to actually see some real code. So this is our CI system. It can build anything, anywhere. XAML, gone. You wanna do something, you just drop a task on there, configure the, tag the task the way that you need, and off and running. You don't see a task that you need, add whatever task that you want. It's extremely easy to do. So first of all, you probably won't have to do any of that because our task list is really, really long. I love this screen because none of this is Microsoft. It's the new age for Microsoft where we play nice with things that you wouldn't normally expect us to play nice with. You see Android on here, we have, um, uh, we even have iOS to put the builds in here as well, so if you wanna go back down here and do Xcode, we can build it on your Mac for you, and again, you can extend this particular pipeline. But this is something that I've done for real. I'm a big fan of SonarCube. SonarCube is for technical debt. It's pretty much the de facto standard, and we've now enabled that for your .NET code as well as your Java code as well. By simply dropping these two guys here, all my technical debt is automatically sent up to SonarCube for me. 
I have a build that I'm running, and obviously I'm going to be running my unit test. I practice what I preach. And the two that I really want to point out is that NuGet package and then the publisher. This actually takes that binary that I've created and packages it up into a NuGet package for me. I don't have to drop to a command line. I don't have to even know how to make a NuGet package. I just use that task and magically it versions it for me and packages it in such a way that I can now publish it to any repo or feed that I want. It doesn't have to be our private one, but obviously it can be. If you really want to go off to GitHub, you can actually use our tools to go to GitHub, not GitHub, um, to NuGet the proper NuGet just as easy as you can our private repo as well, right? So I don't want you to think that this only works with our stuff. It works with all feeds. But just that easily, I'm able to build, test, package, and publish my particular NuGet package. Now, what that ends up looking like is something like this. This is the summary of that. As you can see on the right-hand side, I have some code coverage. This is for my .NET application. I also have my test results showing up here very easily. And I'm going to show you another one of these summaries here that actually light, lights up for the Java environments as well, and not to mention our deployment. I love the fact that every time I come to VSTS, every time I do a demo, I have to like, redo it because there's new features every single time. That deployment tab showed up a couple weeks ago. Visual Studio Team Services is updated every three weeks. Every three weeks, there are new features on there. It makes it tough to demo sometimes, because you get to a page and you don't recognize it anymore because there's all this new functionality on there. But it makes it great as a developer because there's all this new functionality on there all the time. So this is our package management. I get to create as many feeds as I want, and then I target those feeds with the tasks that I just showed you. And as you can see, I have a tracheon.graphlib. Um, I obviously a computer science major. I write pneumatic tube systems. It uses a lot of graphs. So I actually use graph theory and depth first search and breadth first search kind of libraries to figure out cool stuff. And I basically wrote a library that I reuse every time I write a new tube system. Right? So that's something that I reuse in all my applications. And now it's centrally located, and I can use it in my other builds. So how do I actually pull that in? This is a project that actually uses that NuGet package. And all I have to do is the very first line there is make you say, I need you to go resolve all my NuGet packages for me. And it's able to go to NuGet pop proper or to my private repo and actually get all the feeds I need down onto my hard drive so that I can then build my application. The sky is the limit. Remember I said that? That last task down there where it says zip setup, the way that I share this with the customer is I basically zip it up and put it on a OneDrive so they can actually go download it for me. I actually version it with PowerShell as well. So I was able to take a build, build it, version it, zip it up, and then move it to OneDrive completely hands-free. So anything that you want to do, you can actually do from our build system. Finally, I want to talk about Java. Again, we're really, really serious about Java. You have a POM file, you don't have to modify your POM file at all. Just give us your POM file and we will build it for you. We will run all the tests for you and then you will get the exact same experience that we get for our .NET developers. So here you can see that this is a Java app built on any machine that I wanted to build it on, Linux, Mac, or PC. I get amazing code coverage results. I get the status of my deployment because I'm using release management to deploy this. I get my test results just as if I had written them before. All that great functionality that Jeremy just showed us with our commits and our work items are all surfaced right here in our build summary. We have full traceability from the idea all the way through to deployment. At any point, you can find out what you want and get anywhere else inside of our ecosystem. So the traceability that we have is just unparalleled. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about is extensibility. That very first task is one I wrote myself. It's called a WAR converter. Our WAR file is just a zip file. But our Azure Web App doesn't quite like the folder structure inside of a WAR file. But I wanted to use the out-of-the-box Azure deployment task to deploy it. So what do I do? I write a task that simply unzips it, reformats the folders, rezips it, and gives it to Azure. And Azure thinks it's the coolest thing in the world. And now I'm using out-of-the-box functionality to deploy a Java application. And the pers person right in the middle, that Azure Resource Group, allows me to do infrastructure as code. In Azure, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not the biggest fan of our Azure portal, <laughs> so I stay out of it by using infrastructure as code. I'm able to tell Azure, go do this for me. I don't want to do it physically. You go stand up a Java application for me, ready to run Tomcat, and then I'm going to give you the binary. And I can delete that resource group, run this build again, and Azure will magically build everything that I need to host my application completely hands-free. So we have all the power you need to build anything you want, anywhere you want. All right, so I'm going to talk about one more feature here. If you guys already know me, if any, if any of you guys have ever seen me present before, this is probably what I was talking about. Right? I have been married to release management since it was released. I am its biggest fan and proponent. Release management basically allows us to take what we just did in our CI system and then move it into a deployment environment so we can actually deploy it. 
Now, we've done some cool stuff. We've been revamping this. If you've been with us a long time, you everyone remember the WPF application, the gray dungeon? Yep, all gone. Right. What I'm about to show you is the new look and feel, and I'm really happy to announce that you know, those of you who are on TFS right now are getting it an update too. You get to take the S, exactly. <laughs> so the dungeon gets to go away, the WPF gets to go away, it's all going to be web-based, and it's a brilliant, brilliant experience. Parallel deployments is something else that a lot of our customers have been asking for. The more you start to utilize uh, release management, the larger your infrastructure becomes, the more imperative it is that you're able to do things in parallel. So I'll show you some of that things as well. We've also improved our, uh, our approval sequence. Approvals is a huge value add of release management, and we've actually gone ahead and enhanced that some more for you as well. And I'm going to show you that um, right now. So let's hop over here again real quick. And I want to take you here. We're going to basically double click on this particular release pipeline here. As you'll notice, I have environments. Our rebuild system and our release system look a lot alike, and we did that on purpose. Everything that I said about our release system, cross-platform, extensible, all that cool stuff, it's all true about our release system too, because so, they're the, basically the backbone is the same. Now, what we've done in release that's different than build is we added two new concepts. One concept is the environment. An environment is a logical grouping of all the tasks that I want to perform as I move my code from one environment to the next. It's just that simple. It's almost like mini builds if you really think about it. But I get to control when those tasks occur, and I can actually put approvers before and after the occurrence of that. So for example, here in QA, it shows that I have one approver. Now we've done a lot of things to improve this experience. An approver is an individual or a group that gets notified every time they want to enter this particular environment. As that approver, I have the authority to say you can or cannot enter my environment. And if you can, I get to say when you're allowed to enter my environment. Maybe not right now, but a week from today, it's OK. Now, we've enhanced this because if you go here and click More Options, if I list multiple people here, I get to choose if everyone has to approve or only one person has to approve. I also get to control if I send the email blast to everyone at once, and this is basically a free-for-all. They can come in in any order they want. Or do I want to do this in sequence, which means the first guy gets the email, and if he rejects it, no one downstream has to get emails asking if they want to deploy it or not. So we've tried to enhance this to make it a lot more flexible. You can put individuals or you can put groups. If you put a group, any individual in that group has the authority to approve it, and then I can make any combination, and using these options, it's amazing what kind of configurations that you can actually come up with. The other thing I wanted to show you that's just new is the ability to have deployment conditions. I have multiple environments, and I get to choose when do I want this particular environment to kick off. If I had five different QA environments, I could have them all waiting for dev to be successful. When dev is successful, all five of those QA environments will wake up and start deploying themselves instantly versus QA1 and then QA2 and then QA3. However, if you want to roll it out in rings and you really do want QA1 to go first and then QA2, you have the control to do that as well. So what we're trying to do is increase the flexibility in your control over when these actions actually take place. One other thing I forgot to tell you about our, really, our, our CI system that I want to go back in and double click on real quick is our extensibility, right? We talked about anything, anywhere. I wanted to show you this real quick, too. Because Visual Studio Team Services has everything, you could do everything inside of our system. But as Jeremy pointed out, we already know you love some of your systems you already have. If you're already in GitHub, you can stay there. If you're already in Bitbucket, you can stay there. If you're using Team Foundation Server and Version Control, our Git support or Subversion, you don't have to move your code to take advantage of our CI system. Leave it where it is and go ahead and use our system. Every vertical that we talk about today is completely interchangeable. I have a blog post where I basically replace our build system with Jenkins. Everything else is exactly the same. The work items, the automated, the automated deployment, everything works, even though you can replace our build system with Jenkins. Because we understand people like Jenkins already. They might already have a huge investment there. I would encourage you to reevaluate. <laughs> That's just me. But be perfectly honest. If I evaluated Jenkins against our XAML, I would have picked Jenkins too. Be perfectly transparent. If I were to reevaluate today, I would definitely choose ours. So definitely go ahead and give that a double click as well. So there's one other thing I want to talk about with release management, and I'm actually going to need some help to do this. So I'm a big proponent of when I do a demo. I don't want to just do a demo of deploying the front end. It's really important that you do the back end as well. Right? And I want to invite Steve on stage with me. He's a partner of ours from Redgate, who's going to show you some of the cool functionality to enable you to deploy your back end databases along with the rest of your code using release management. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. So I'm Steve Jones. I work for Redgate Software as Evangelist. I also run SQLServerCentral.com. And I've been working with SQL Server for uh, 20 years now. Wow. Like, man, 25 years, actually, since 1991. And how many of you love working with databases? <laughs> Not many of you, right? It's a pain. Data is difficult, right? Unlike code, we can throw code away and rebuild it. Databases, we have to keep that data around. Uh, Redgate, we spent a lot of time over the last few years trying to make databases as easy to work with as your code. We've built ReadyRoll, which allows me to work in Visual Studio just like I do all the other code, just like your Java code, just like your .NET code, your ASP.NET code. We've got first-class project here. And when I work with this, I've already built a project here. And my project is a database project, and it's a sub-project of a Visual Studio solution. So my ASP.NET code or any other code that I have is right there. And what I do is I work in Visual Studio just like I might work elsewhere. So when I made a change to a table, ReadyRoll generated this code for me. But I have the ability to customize it. For doing something like a not null column where I might have to do data manipulation, I can do that here. I deploy it to my, data, my local database. It looks good. And then I go and head and commit it to my repo. Right? So I've got the changes right here that you can see. I've associated it with a work item. Uh, I can do the commit like I do anything else. Working with databases is just like working with all the other Visual Studio code I do. What I really like about this is the fact that when I go and I add a column to a database because I'm actually supporting a feature, I can actually check in the code and the database schema as a unit, right? Exactly. You could do the same thing. So I could associate all these changes together so that as my app versions, my database versions together. Gotcha. And now Donovan showed you some of the great stuff in uh, Visual Studio Team Services. I'm going to do a build of that database project right here. Here's my build definition. Yeah, I was shocked when I first saw this. So Steve and I went through a dry run yesterday, and I'm thinking, well, where are all the Redgate tasks, right, that I'm going to have to do to do this, this database build? And he was like, well, it's nothing special, right? It's a part of the solution that you're going to build with Visual Studio anyway. Yeah. There's no black magic there. All you have to do is basically set a parameter. Yeah. And the next thing you know, it's just your normal build, not something special or magic that you so have Ready to Roll do. So ReadyRoll is just a Visual Studio project, Visual Studio solution. So we're just using the, the default tasks that come in here to build this. And when I build it, I get a similar view to what Donovan had showed before. So here's a build I did earlier. You can see here I've got uh, my migrations in the lower right-hand corner. It kind of lets me what's going to happen, what's going to be applied to this environment. Uh, because I've already deployed this, I actually do see uh, the deployment down here. We know that's happened. I see my code coverage testing in the upper right. And then we produce an artifact. Just like with your software, you want an artifact that you can then, as a potential release candidate, right, sure. for somewhere else. So here we produce one where I've got my SQL, I've got PowerShell, which is how uh, ReadyRoll is based. It packages up stuff and decides what needs to be deployed. And I've got various metadata to help me ensure that I get a successful deployment. I really like this extension because it's almost like you chose every place you could extend Visual Studio Team Services you have because right. your build summary has it in there uh, and the fact that you have your artifacts publishing. And I even noticed that there's a couple database specific tasks that you yeah. add, tabs that you added to our summary. We well. added these and we'll see those in the release side because we awesome. tried to make this as simple and as easy to do as all your other Visual Studio code. So developers working in Visual Studio, operational folks, we're trying to bring you together with transparency and linkage. Here's my release. Now, just like Donovan's release, I've got a few tasks in here. I'm deploying my ReadyRoll database package, and I'm running unit tests. I'm deploying to a specific instance and a specific database. I'm running unit tests because we agree with you. Unit, you've got to run unit tests. <laughs> unit tests are good. We can write unit tests in a database right now and run them against a database. I can deploy my app at the same time and do testing of the overall application structure at once. And when I finish that, I get similar results. Now, this release is set up to automatically deploy to QA when somebody checks in code so that it gets tested and then deployed to QA so that somebody can actually do additional testing and look at it. Uh, I can go to staging and production as well. And I don't think I showed, but I actually have approvers set up for staging and production. But QA just goes automatically. And when I deploy it, I can skip my test results so I can see what actually ran, successful or unsuccessful. Yeah, what if I'm like a DBA, though, right? Because I, I know a lot of DBAs that want to see the script that was actually run. Right. They do. They absolutely do. I'm a DBA by trade for, for most of my career. Uh, we give you this overall view so I can see which objects changed. In this case, I've altered a table. I've added a few other objects. But if we want to look at that actual script, we can see the actual script. And if I wanted to find that one section of code, it's good. So this will get you off my back, right? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Good. Well, if it works or doesn't work, the DBA can look at this code. Here's that code that was in Visual Studio. We Perfect. could debate it, argue, decide whether it <laughs> works or doesn't Arm work. Arm wrestle, whatever it takes to Whatever it takes there. to do that. Perfect. And so we've added our extension. It's in the Visual Studio Marketplace. Uh, it gives you those tasks, allow you to use ReadyRoll to, uh, to build things. And 
If you want more information, uh, redgate.com, we've got Ready Roll, or come to the booth, talk to us later. We're happy yeah, I think to your booth out. is 424, I believe, right? I think so, it's on the other one, right? Uh, no, it's not there. Yeah, it's not there. But We're right by the team services. Perfect, yeah. So if you have some more questions for the Redgate guys, please go by their booth and see them. Steve, thank you so much for showing thank us you. that. So actually, um, Jeremy, why don't you go ahead and join me up here on stage again too. So we're gonna talk about a little bit more of this. So monitor and learn. This is Application Insights. Uh, how much time do we have? I'll tell you a personal story. So I use Application Insights on one of my applications. You might have noticed there was a video running on my Who Am I slide. That's actually me driving. I, I race cars for fun, and I run one of the nation's largest online motorsports events for uh, guys who wanna race their cars. And on the front page, there's three different ways that you can actually view the calendar. And there's one way that I'm just dying to get rid of. But before I deleted it, I decided I'll use Application Insights to actually monitor and learn how my users are actually using my application. So what I did is I went into the code and I added some telemetry that said show me or tell me every time someone uses this particular feature of my site before I go and delete all the code because I just don't want to maintain it anymore. I was shocked by the number of visitors that actually still use that functionality that I would have <laughs> really upset had I just decided to blindly delete that feature. So it's really important to not just go and make edu just guessing. There's no reason to guess anymore, right? We now have the technology for you to monitor the way that your users are actually using your application and go back and make changes. Visual Studio Team Services, the amount of telemetry and, and monitoring that we do, it's staggering yep. the amount of data that we have available to us to be able to determine if something's failing before you even know that something is actually failing. And it's something I look at at a daily basis. When I That's come great. up, I'm looking in version control, we roll out a new feature, I see how well it works, I see how customers respond to it, and see if there's tweaks that we need to make. And it's just, it's invaluable being able to have that tight loop whenever you're rolling something out. I can't Especially agree. if you can do it incrementally with something like LaunchDarkly. Absolutely, and I was thinking, because I'm sitting here watching uh, Steven on stage, and I know how nervous I get when I'm doing database deployments regardless. And it'd be nice to be able to have feature flags kind of joined into that story to where I can hide the feature, deploy my database, test it, and then once I know it's good, then unhide that feature using LaunchDarkly. So these extensions that we're making, they're not mutually exclusive. You can actually use multiple of them to get exactly what you need out of our tool set. So we're not gonna go really, really deep for time on um, monitoring and learning, but we have other sessions that we would direct you to so that you can go and learn more about not only App Insights, but also Hockey App. Um, little sneak preview, make sure you don't miss the keynote tomorrow, because I'm, I'm gonna show you some of this cool stuff too live, all right? So uh, just don't, don't be late though, because I think I'm one of the earlier, earlier demos, so. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let Jeremy uh, go ahead and do the roadmap for us of what's coming in the future. Yeah, so this isn't everything that's coming over the next one to three months. As you'd imagine, we have a lot of things going on. I just picked up a couple highlights that I thought people would care about. This top one, another big one that's close to my heart, change work item type. I cannot wait for that, man. I know, they're so I cannot awesome. wait. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bug, that was a feature. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I feel like almost every day I get some, exactly. oh, this is a minor bug fix, right? It's like, no, 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 no. no this is weeks of work. Exactly. So I can easily just swap that over to a feature and we can get started on it. Perfect. More agile process customization. I talked about pick list support. We have even more fields and field types to get that uh, up to the level that you need to really dial in that agile process to exactly what you want. Redesigning the branches hub with GitFlow. So this is one that I'm working on and really excited about. So a lot of people when they're new to Git are still trying to figure out how do I handle branches? How do I handle releases? If you have a really large team, you probably have a whole lot of branches. How do you get through that? So we've redesigned the new branches page, and I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit later today on a Git talk. Cool. Um, to show a little bit of what we're doing to have branch hierarchies, how you can delete branches right in line, quickly get to policies, lock your branch, do all those common actions right from there. NPM support for package management. Great. The world is bigger than NuGet. We yes, know that. it is. It is. We're trying to get there. Release management, REST APIs, and service hooks. Finally going to be public. Be yeah. And import from Team Foundation Server will be GA. So this is the data import I was talking about earlier. We're actually going to be bringing that available to all customers instead of just a private pilot that we have now. Awesome. So these are just a few of the things that we have ahead of us over the next couple of months. Yeah, I'm really excited about the REST API becoming public because I've already been playing with that. I mean, that's how you get things like Jenkins and other CI systems to be able to trigger an automated release, right? We, at Microsoft, we're trying to, again, play nice, the new Microsoft. So we have REST APIs and service hooks on both ends of every product that we create so that as long as your other tool can access REST APIs, you can make our tools do whatever you want them to do. 
Now, we are at time, but what we are going to do for Q&A is that we have a booth that we're going to have some experts at the booth for you so that you can go and pick their brain uh, and ask them whatever questions that you have. But guys, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Yeah. Thank you. Good job.